right. Okay, hello everyone. We are live with uh, the first talk of the day, uh, which is Tim Mascalier. Um, Tim is uh, hello. The of Toulouse. Hello, Tim. Uh, I've, no I've known Tim for years as he was one of the early users of Brian and, uh, and very enthusiastic about it. So I have very like, positive, warm feelings towards Tim for that, if nothing else. Um, so yes, so Tim is going to talk to us about uh, some of his cool stuff in, uh, in backpropagation and spiking your networks. So um, yeah, please take it away, Tim. All right. So everyone see, sees my slide, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm a CNRS researcher. I work in Toulouse at the uh, Centre de Recherche Cerveau et Cognition, which would be something like Brain and Cognition Research Center. And um, today I'm going to talk about backpropagation in spiking neural networks. But before I get started, I, want, I really want to thank the organizers because I think this workshop is great. And, uh, and um, here I want to, to insist a bit because, uh, you know, usually people say that and they don't really mean it. And uh, <laughs> I've said the, that in, in the past without really meaning it, but this time I really mean it. Okay, um, you know, I, I, many times or I, all the time when I go to workshops or conferences, I have the feeling that I am only interested in a minority of the talks there. And this time I have the feeling that I'm interested in all the talks. <laughs> it's the first time it happens to me. So this is great. So I have the feeling that I, I have finally found my community. Uh, first good piece of news. And second good piece of news, uh, this community is huge, right? Uh, it's much, much larger than what I thought. So I'm not alone. So it feels, it feels very good. So thanks to the organizer, Dan and, and Friedemann. And uh, we should do that more regularly. And I can, I can help. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, just as, as the size of the community, we have 195 people watching live right now. Wow, um, this, this is by far the yeah. biggest audience I have ever had. So <laughs> and, and I'm, I am afraid. And we've people at, at least one of the talks so far. So it's it's a big community. Yeah, bigger yeah. than we expected. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so great. Uh, so um, as I said, my, my talk is about backpropagation in, in spiking neural networks. So what, what, what is backpropagation? Well, it, it's an algorithm for supervised learning in feed-forward uh, artificial neural networks. So what I mean by supervised learning is it's a fitting algorithm. Basically, you want your network to produce a certain output for a certain input. So uh, basically, you, you, do, you define a cost function, which is a distance between the uh, desired output and the actual input that, that you get for a given input. So this, this loss function, technically, it's only defined in the last layer, in the output layer of the network. And uh, for the distance, you can use the mean square error, for instance, or the cross entropy. And then um, you want to find the optimal weights for your, your network uh, or other parameters, and you want to find them using gradient descent. So basically, you move the weights in the opposite uh, direction of the gradient. Okay, and the tour de force of backprop, if you like, is that because uh, the loss is only defined at the output layer, and um, Sorry, just to interrupt you for one second. Yes. Uh, should your should your slide should we be seeing uh, the um, like the PowerPoint window, or should we be seeing your slides full screen? Because we're seeing the window at the moment on the first on the title slide. No, you should see my slides. Ah, okay. In that case, we are not seeing the right thing. All right. So maybe I should I, I try to share the as a, only the PowerPoint, but maybe I should share the whole thing. Uh, yeah, maybe because, yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll close this one and then and, and you can uh, reshare again. All right. All right, let's see if it works better. Okay. Yeah, we're, set, we're seeing your whole screen now. Okay, right. yeah, no, your slides, it's all good. Okay, fantastic. So, um, yeah, basically you want, you want to move the, your weights in the opposite direction of the gradient. Um, and the, oops. All right. And the, the, the tour de force of backprop, because as I said, the loss is only defined in the output layer. But in fact, the tour de force of backprop is to be able to compute the gradients uh, in all the layers recursively. And um, 
This could be done not manually, but using automatic differentiation. And in fact, backprop is a short for backward propagation of errors. Okay. And um, why is backprop so cool? Because it solves the credit assignment problem, uh, which, which could be rephrased in uh, what should the hidden layers do? Because as I said, uh, backprop is a fitting algorithm. So basically the input is specified, the output that you want is specified, but uh, the e activations in the hidden layers are not specified. So backprop basically tells the hidden layers what to do in order to help. Uh, another way to say the same thing is that uh, backprop optimizes the feature extraction and the classifier jointly. Um, I'm saying that because before, before using backprop, I've done a lot of work using, for instance, STDP. And some people have also designed um, uh, feature extractors manually, like Swift or Org or stuff like that. And, um, and then I would, we would feed those features to a classifier and we would optimize this classifier. But uh, the tour de force of backprop is to optimize both steps jointly. It's joint optimization. So basically, it, optimizes, it finds the best features for the classification task you want to do. So this is really cool. Another cool feature, the number of layer, uh, the number of layers is arbitrary, at least in theory. In practice, you can have some problems like the vanishing gradient or stuff like that. But in theory, it, it can, the number of layers is arbitrary. So it opens the door for very deep nets and it has fueled the deep learning revolution. So this motivated us and others, of course, to adapt backprop to spiking neural networks. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects in adapting uh, backprop to spiking neural networks. The first project is about when you want to deal with static stimuli, and we're going to assume uh, a latency-based coding there, and we're going to de derive a, a new uh, backprop learning rule for this sort of coding. And the second uh, series of projects is uh, when we want to deal with uh, dynamic stimuli, and then it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's, you, you need more than one spike per neuron, and we, for this particular case, we use a surrogate gradient learning. Okay, so let's get started with the first project. It's called S4NN. S4NN is a, a short for Single Spike Supervised Spiking Neural Network. So this project is done in collaboration with Saïd Reza Kerat Pichet. So Saïd used to do his PhD with me a couple of years ago. He came to Toulouse and now he's back to Iran. He has a, his assistant professor at Chaid Beshetti University in Tehran. And uh, basically, as I said, uh, in this work, we use latency coding. Um, so what is, let me explain the concept. The concept is uh, you have to imagine a spiking neural network, which is at rest before being presented with a stimulus. And in that case, the stronger the stimulus, the earlier the first spike. So if you have a weak stimulus, for instance, you may not reach the threshold at all. So you have no spike at all. If you use a medium stimulus, then you have a spike at a certain time point. And if you use an even stronger stimulus, you have an earlier spike. Okay, So it's a simple concept, but it's different from what most people assume um, when they deal with spiking neural networks. They assume that uh, uh, the intensity of the activation is converted into a rate. Here, it's converted into a latency. There is no rate here because there is only, only one spike per neuron. So you cannot define a, a rate, but you can define a latency. It's an analog value, um, and it can be used to encode information. So it's a simple concept, but you see that it can encode a special stimulus into a special temporal spike wave. So this particular stimulus will, will generate this particular spike wave, and the spike wave is a signature of the stimulus, because if you change the stimulus, for instance, this stimulus would cause another spike wave. Okay. Um, it's also known as time to first spike coding. Um, as I said, it's suitable for static stimuli because if zero stimuli evolves through time, you need more spikes to encode it. But if it's static, uh, then one spike, I think one spike is, is enough. Uh, there is some biological plausibility for this sort of coding. For instance, in the visual systems, as for instance, this paper by Golish and Meister. It's very fast because basically you can, uh, you need just one spike to encode the information. So you don't need to wait for subsequent spikes in order to know the, the activation of the neuron. One spike is enough. Uh, for the same reason, it's very energy efficient because usually uh, in the brain and also on neuromorphic hardware, 
uh, the energy consumption is mostly related to spike uh, emission. So if you don't, if you have very few spikes, you save energy. Uh, and if you do it smartly, the latency coding, if you implement uh, it smartly using event-driven computation, then the, the time represents itself. Uh, you never store the time. You use the time for computation, but you never store the timestamps, for instance, or you don't have to. So there is no memory footprint. So this is really a really cool feature because time is, a, is an analog, uh, the latency is an analog variable. It could be uh, arbitrarily precise and you don't store it. So you, there is no memory footprint. Um, so this motivated us and others, of course, um, to adapt backprop to this sort of coding scheme. So others, for instance, there was this uh, seminal work by Sander, uh, Spike, uh, Spike Prop, uh, nearly uh, 20 years ago now. Uh, yesterday, we also heard about uh, the work by uh, Julia. And uh, this, uh, this project is in, in the similar line. Uh, yet, we use a much simpler neuron model. In fact, we use... Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I forgot to say that this paper has been published this year in International Journal of Neural System, and the code is available on GitHub. And as I said, we use a very simple uh, neuron model. It's an integrate and fire neuron, non-leaky. Non there is no leak, and it uses instantaneous synapses. So it couldn't be simpler. Here you see an example of the potential as a function of time. So when a spike is received, it increases instantaneously. Then it's flat because there is no leak. And at some point, it may reach the threshold and produce an output spike, which defines the latency of the given neuron. And then we stop the computation because we are not interested in subsequent spikes. So we don't need to do a reset. We don't need to integrate again. We are done, basically. And um, so what we do is we, we define a... Um, Okay, the, the desired activation in the last layer are defined in terms in terms of desired firing times, desired latencies in the output layer. Basically, we want the neuron uh, for for the good category to be the first one to fire, and uh, we can define the error uh, of latencies based on the difference between the desired latencies and the actual latencies, and we are going to backpropagate those errors uh, through the network. Let me explain how this is done. So here, this is an example. Um, basically, I have, um, I'm interested in computing uh, the gradient of the loss with respect to this WJI, which is the weight of the synapse between neuron I and neuron J. First, we're going to apply the chain rule. So the derivative of the loss with respect to this W is just a product of derivative. Here, here we have the derivative of the loss with respect to the latency of J times the derivative of the latency of J with respect to the potential of J at the, at the time of threshold crossing. And uh, here we have the derivative of, of the potential with respect to WJI. Okay, so this is just a notation. The first one, we are going to call it delta J. Uh, for the second uh, one, um, yeah, I forgot to mention that if a neuron doesn't spike, during the, the old simulation, we, we somehow invent a fake spike at time t max, which is a maximum number of time steps. And uh, so uh, if the, the threshold was not reached at time t max, we invent a, a false spike. But in that case, moving the potential has no effect on the latency because the latency will remain at t max anyway. So uh, in that case, this derivative would be zero. But in the other cases, which are more standard when you have a real spike, then if you increase the potential, you are going to decrease the latency, okay? Because if you increase the potential, the threshold will be reached earlier. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not able to compute this term act act exactly, but I know that it's negative. Because uh, again, if you increase the potential, that will cause a spike before in time. So we are only going to keep the sign of this relationship minus one. Okay, we, we don't we don't we don't we don't know the exact value. We keep only the sign. It's a crude approximation, I know, but <laughs> in practice it works quite well. And then the last term, the derivative of the potential with respect to to WJI. Well, if uh, I, I helped in reaching the threshold, which is if I was TI was before TJ, then this derivative is is one because increasing the W would increase the potential. 
But uh, if Ti is after Tj, it means I sent a spike to J after J reached its, its threshold. So this spike was unuseful. And then the derivative is if zero, is zero. Okay, so this is the first um, uh, equation. And the second equation, like in classic backprop, is to use a total derivative because we want to compute the delta j as a function of the deltas in the subsequent layer. So for this, we use a total derivative. We iterate over k, where k are all the neurons that uh, j touches. So we have the sum of derivative of the loss with respect to la the latency of k times the derivative of tk as, uh, with respect to Tj. So this first term is just delta k. This is just the notation. And this second term here, uh, again, we need an approximation. So just to give you an intuition of the approximation we use, uh, you, you, you would notice that if Tj is after Tk, again, it means uh, the changing the latency of J has no influence on the latency of K because, because uh, J was too late anyway. So in, th in this particular case, um, the derivative is zero. But in the other case where Tj is before Tk, uh, well, changing the latency of J clearly has an impact on the latency of K. And this impact, you feel that it depends on the synaptic weight. For instance, if the synaptic weight is zero, then this impact would be zero. Uh, but if the synaptic weight is strong, then uh, changing the latency of J will have a strong impact on the latency of K. So we just assumed a linear relationship. Uh, again, it's a crude approximation, but we, we know that this derivative depends on WKJ. We just assumed it was proportional to WKJ. Um, so this leads to the following equation. And of course, uh, for the output neuron, uh, the deltas are defined because we can compute the mean square error um, given the desired latencies. And then we can back propagate the, the errors using this recursive uh, equation, like in classic backprop. So using this approach, we used a very simple network, a fully connected network. Um, and um, so there was no convolution. It's only a one single layer um, uh, fully connected, one single hidden layer, sorry, fully connected. And we got uh, pretty good performances on uh, the NIST um, data set, comparable to others, or I would say in the uh, um, similar to, to, to comparable networks. Uh, but I would argue that uh, our neuron model is much simpler and more hardware friendly. Uh, another cool aspect of this work is that uh, the processing can stop as soon as the neuron fires in the readout layer. So as soon as you have one spike in the readout layer, you can stop the, the computation. You don't need, you, because you decide based on the, on the first spike and you don't need to, 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 to continue with the computation. And at that time, only a few percent of the neurons have fired. Uh, more recently, we are working on a binarized version of this network. So basically, we, we constrain the weights to be um, uh, either minus one or one. So we could encode them with just one bit. The motivation, of course, is to decrease the memory and computation footprints, at least at inference time. Um, so basically, we have the, the real valued weights W as before, and we define their binary version, which is just their sign. B equals sine of W. In the forward pass of backpropagation, we use the binary weights. And in the backward pass, we use the real valued weights uh, to backpropagate the, the gradients. And we use a straight through estimator introduced by Courbarieu. Basically, we, it's like we pretend that we used the real valued weight in the forward pass when we do the backward pass. Um, so it's uh, again a, a crude approximation and it has a small cost on accuracy. Uh, you see here on NIST and Fashion MNIST, S4 and N reaches 97.4 and, and 88. And um, there is a little drop of accuracy if you switch to, to binary weights, but I would argue that it can be acceptable given the decrease of memory and computation footprint. 
so just to conclude this first project, uh, I think it's interesting from a neuroscience point of view and from an AI point of view. From a neuroscience point of view, the trained model is compatible with the speed of processing in the primate visual system. We know that we, we recognize objects uh, with at most one spike per neuron. Uh, and uh, the current model can explain this sort of rapid processing. Even if the way we trained it, I would not pretend it's biologically plausible, but the resulting model can be. And um, for, for AI, it's interesting, I think, because inference can be done very efficiently on low power neuromorphic chips. All right, so with that, I'm done with the first um, <clears throat> project. Now I'm going to, to talk about a second line of projects uh, which deal with dynamic stimuli. Uh, and for this, we are going to use surrogate gradient learning. And uh, we, we will see two applications. One is for speech recognition and one is for internet cl uh, traffic classification. Okay, so what is the surrogate gradient learning um, approach? Well, I think it's especially suitable to process dynamic stimuli. For those stimuli, uh, we have to release the at most one spike per neuron constraint that we had so far in S4NN. Why? Because the stimulus evolves, evolves through time. So it changes through time. So we, we need to encode those changes. We cannot uh, keep only one spike for that because the stimulus then, then will change and we need to encode those changes with, with additional spikes. And uh, similarly, we have to release the no leak constraint that we had in S4NN, because now a leak is crucial, I think, because a leak will help you to forget uh, all the events, all the input events. Uh, and you need that uh, because you don't want the current output to be influenced forever by, uh, by, uh, by an input. Um, so we release those constraints. What we do is uh, we train a spike neural network with backprop through time. Uh, for this, we need to discretize the time. Um, and the firing threshold causes an optimization issues. We'll, we'll, uh, this will become clearer with the next slides. And for this problem, we use a surrogate gradient. Uh, in practice, it means we can train a spike neural network using uh, frameworks that uh, leverage automatic differentiation like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So we don't have to compute the gradients manually. Uh, all right, <clears throat> so that was an introduction of, on surrogate gradient learning. Let, let's uh, get, uh, let, let me give you some more details. Uh, for the neuron model, we use the leaky integrated fire neuron, but we could use other neurons, but for simplicity is the one we use so far. And we use a very simple, the simplest version of it where the synapses are instantaneous. So basically the input current is a weighted sum of Dirac delta functions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so this is a formulation um, with the differential equation, but you equiv there is an equivalent formulation, which is that uh, for every input spike, you will have an instantaneous increase of potential. Uh, the, and this increase will correspond to the weight of the synapse through which the spike arrived. So each input spike causes an instantaneous jump of potential and then the potential decays back to the resting value, which is zero in this, in this particular example. We could use more complex synapse models like with non-instantaneous synapse with a time scale. This introduces another differential equation, but for simplicity here, we use just instantaneous synapses. Uh, and of course, if the threshold is reached, then you have to fire an output spike and you have to reset the potential to zero. Well, this, those are the formulations in continuous time. But as I said, we want to apply backprop through time. So we need to, to work in discrete time now. So what are the discrete versions of those equations? Well, here, here they are. So basically, we are only interested in the potential on, uh, um, on the time steps, on multiple um, times the time steps, not on, uh, on every time points. And uh, then we, uh, the equivalent of the differential equation is the following recursive equation. We have the potential at time step n plus one equals the potential at time step n multiplied by beta, where beta is a leak coefficient. Um, 
So, so this reduces the effect of the leak between t and t plus delta t. Actually, this part of the equation is, direct, is, exact, is actually exact. There is no approx approximation there. If you integrate the differential equation between t and t plus delta t, this will give you this exact multiplicative coefficient. There is no approximation there. But here we, we make some approximations. Those are the jumps in potential caused by the input spikes in the particular time beam. So SJ in here is a, is a tensor. It's a binary tensor containing the input spikes. So basically it's one if you have a spike arriving through synapse J in the corresponding time beam, in time beam N, and otherwise it's zero. And here why I say it's an approximation because basically we ignore the difference in arrival times between all the spikes that arrived in the particular time step. We consider, we do as if they were synchronous. We ignore the, so for, for this reason, we cannot use a, a, a too big, uh, too large time step. We have to use a, a small time step for this approximation to be, to be reasonable. Um, and then we have the, this reset term, which I will detail later. When we have out, output spikes, we need to reset the, the potential to subtract the, the threshold. At each time step, we check if the threshold is reached. So this is done by applying the heavy side uh, step function to V uh, the potential minus the threshold. If it's more than the potential is more than the threshold, we generate an output spike, S out equal one, otherwise we don't, S out equals zero. And if we generate an output spike, then we have to reset the potential. So we have to subtract the, the threshold to the potential. This is a soft reset. Um, and um, so this is a recurrent equation. So it, it should make you think of recurrent neural network. And indeed, we can unfold this recurrent equation through time. And um, so on this slide, I'm, I'm going to try not to spend too much time because Emre had a very similar slide yesterday. Um, so basically, the idea is to un unroll the network through time to get a feed-forward network that you can train with backprop. Uh, so you see the time on the uh, x-axis here. Uh, so you see the different time step, time step 0, 1, 2. And you see all the influences between the different variables on this graph. So for instance, a spike that enters here will impact the potential of layer 1 in the next time step through the weight matrix W. Uh, this beta is a leak that traduces the leakage from time step zero to time step one for the potential. Here, uh, at each time step, you check if the potential is more than the threshold. And if yes, you generate an output spike. So this is a heavy side function. And if you have an output spike, you reset the potential. This is this link. And um, so once you have unrolled the network, you can, in theory, train it with backprop. But there is still a, a problem here, which is this heavy side function, because the derivative of the heavy side function is zero everywhere and infinite at the threshold. Let me explain that better. Here you see in blue the step function. And here you see its derivative. So its derivative is, is zero everywhere, and it's infinite at the threshold. So you cannot use it for backpropagation, because uh, the gradient would be either zero, zero or infinite, which means you cannot use it numerically. So to overcome this problem, uh, there is a really cool idea uh, that was proposed not by me, but by <laughs> colleagues, uh, Emre, Friedman, and uh, Esham, in, uh, in this uh, review paper in, uh, that was published last year, Surrogate Gradient Learning in Spiking Neural Networks. Uh, actually, the, this is a review paper. So the idea, the idea first appeared in other papers in 2018, maybe, by papers by them and others. But to me, it was really by reading this review that I really understood the concept and that I really understood that it was a game game changer um, because um, uh, it would it would it would allow somehow to the SNNs to to compete. Uh, with ANN in a more balanced way. It would make the competition between those two more balanced <laughs> because we could use the same weapons, the same uh, optimization algorithms and the same frameworks. And it would make the competition more fair, if you like. So the trick, uh, I still didn't explain fully. So the trick is to um, 
so when you do the forward pass of backpropagation, you apply the true function, the heavy side function, which is what you should do. But when you do the backward pass, you just pretend that you used a sigmoid in the forward pass. You didn't, but you just pretend you did. So you use the derivative of the sigmoid instead. So it feels a little bit like a hack, and it is a hack, but in practice, it works very well. Um, all right. Uh, another thing that uh, that uh, another ingredient that I wanted to put in our networks is is uh, is de heterogeneous conduction delays, because I think that uh, delays matter a lot in spacking neural networks. First, if you if you add some delays, it it uh, increase it uh, it increases the, the richness. Uh, of the dynamics of uh, of your dynamical system, and um, in terms of e expressive power of spiking neural network, it increases a lot uh, the expressive power of your spiking neural network. The reason is because the neurons can detect complex spatiotemporal patterns and not just synchrony patterns. So this was this point was made by Izikevich in 2006. For instance, if you have three neurons B, C, and D, and two output neurons A and E. If B, C, and D fire at the same time, then A will receive three asynchronous spikes, and so will E, and neither of them will, will reach thresh threshold. But if you hit first D, then C, then B, the conduction delays might compensate the initial offsets, and then A would receive three synchronous spikes and would fire a spike. And conversely, if you fire B, C, and D in this order, then you would elicit the spike in your own E. So it's it's a simple mechanism, but really it, it can enrich the expressive power and the and the dynamics. So uh, I wanted to add heterogeneous delays. The way we did it is uh, by introducing temporal convolutions. Um, so <clears throat> the concept is um, is the following. Let's say that between two layers, you, you have uh, three connections on this example, and each connection is defined with a weight and a delay. The delay should be a multiple of the of the time step. We still use discrete time. So, and between two neurons, you can have multiple connections with different weights and different delays. Well, the way we are going to represent those connections is using a temporal kernel. Uh, so, for instance, this connection here with a weight three and a delay four is represented here because here you have the time steps. So, one, two, three, four, the fourth time step, and this is for neuron. Uh, for a favorite one, those two connections are represented here. And basically, we, to compute the input for this layer, we are going to convolve the output of this layer with a temporal kernel, um, which will simulate the conduction delays. And uh, the, the, another trick that we use is we want to explore broad uh, delays. We, we want to explore uh, to have a big range between the shortest and the longest delays. But we don't want to use a too big uh, kernel because that, uh, it would overfit. So for this, we use a concept of dilation, which is we force some coefficients to be zero uh, in order not to overfit and yet to have a broad range of delays. So the first application um, that I'm going to talk about is uh, an application for speech command classification. Uh, this is work done in collaboration with Romain Zimmer, who was a master student last year. He did his research project under my supervision uh, at CERCO and also under the supervision of Thomas Pellegrini, uh, who is a, a professor at the University of Toulouse. He's a specialist of deep learning for audio. Um, so we used the Google speech command data set. Um, so this data set has uh, 60K uh, files of uh, one, second of, uh, one second of recordings uh, containing different commands. Uh, there are uh, 12 classes to discriminate, 10 commands like yes, no, up, and so on, one unknown class, and one silence class. And um, so for this, the first uh, step uh, we used was to compute a spectrogram of the sounds. So uh, a spectrogram is uh, the energy, represents the energy that is contained in the sound at every time step and in every frequency band. Um, so then, uh, so that was the input of the network. And then we used uh, three convolutional layers. So convolution, uh, convolutions were done in, in uh, time to implement 
conduction delays and in frequency. Um, so we had three uh, of such layers in a row. And then we had um, fully connected, uh, the RIDAL player was a fully connected layer. It was the only non-spiking layer of the network. B basically, we took the mean, those were uh, leaf neurons with no threshold. So basically, they have a, p a, p a potential that is computed with a leaky integration, but they never reached the threshold. And we took the mean of their potential over time to decide. We, we decide the, the, uh, the class of the stimulus based on the neuron with the m uh, maximum mean potential. So um, <clears throat> this is an example of uh, a certain word, off, which is pronounced. And you see the spectrogram of the word off. And here you see the spikes for one uh, channel of the first convolutional layer. So the kernel is slided over the frequencies. This is why you have different frequencies. And here you see the time. And here you see the spikes that are emitted as a function of time. It's a binary tensor. Uh, here you see the potential in the readout layer. So the only non-spiking layer uh, before and after learning. This is before learning. And after learning, you see that usually one neuron corresponding to the category of the stimulus has a much stronger response than the other neurons. And um, we decide, as I said, based on the mean potential of this neuron on the, on, the, uh, on the total duration of the simulation. Uh, with this approach, we reached a test accuracy of 94%. So this is really good, because if you compare to standard deep learning, it's only slightly above, 96, 97. Um, so we get really close to state-of-the-art using non-spiking networks. And uh, despite the fact that we imposed, we, we managed to keep the firing rate quite low, five hertz on average. So the spikes are quite rare in this network, which is good for energy. So we published uh, those results in a tech report. It's an archive. And we also published the code. It's on GitHub. Uh, now I'm going to talk about a second application. Uh, which is maybe more original for most of you. It was for me. Um, it, uh, what we want to do now is to classify encrypted internet uh, traffic. So this is a work that is done in collaboration with Ali Raste. He's a PhD student at Sharif University, whom I co-supervise remotely. Uh, again, Romain Zimmer, the master student. Florian Delpech was a uh, a, a student at Superhero last year, and he did a research project under my supervision and under the supervision of Carlos Aguilar, who is a professor of computer science at Superhero, and who knows uh, more than me about traffic classification, about internet traffic. Um, okay, so, so what we want... Um, yes? We're running over a little bit on time, so if you could try and go through this bit quickly, that would be great. All right, all right. Uh, uh, it's, the, it's the last project, so it should be okay. Um, okay. So, cool. so basically, uh, we, want, we, we want to be able to recognize the category of the traffic, for instance, voice over IP, video, file transfer, chat, and browsing. Uh, despite the fact that the, the traffic is encrypted, for instance, using a VPN or using Tor, why we want to do that? Because we want to prioritize the traffic to enhance user experience. For instance, if it's vo voice over IP, you should, you should give higher priorities than is it, if it is file transfer, for instance. So we took inspiration for, from a paper published at Infocom by Shapira and Shavit. What they did is they, they first represented so we, we cannot look what is inside the packet because it's encrypted, but the information we have is the packet arrival time and the packet sizes. So re they represented those uh, information in a point clouds. And you see that they already look very different. This is VPN voice over IP. This is VPN chat. Here you see the time, the X axis and the, and the um, packet size on the Y axis. They already look very different. And uh, from those cloud, cloud points, they created histograms, and they classify those histograms using a CNN, the Net5, as if, you, uh, as if they were images. So they, basically, they treated the time as a special dimension. And what we do here, what our approach is to use a SNN instead. Uh, why? Because this, 
sort of internet traffic classification should normally be run on a satellite. So there are strong energy constraints. And we also think that the temporal patterns are presumably highly diagnostic here. But we wanted to treat time as time, not as space, not as they did. So because we wanted to, to build a causal system that, that could be suitable for real-time inference. So basically, uh, we don't want to, to, to build a system that sees the future. The, the network can only see one time step at a time, and it cannot see the future. It's a very simple network. It has just one hidden layer, of fully connected uh, a fully connected layer, and one readout layer. So there is no convolution, no delays. And we just we are just going to 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 sw to swipe this uh, <coughs> simple network through the time steps, um, and our preliminary results. Okay, it's a work in progress, but uh, our preliminary results are, are are quite encouraging. We reach a test accuracy of nearly 94. It's similar or even slightly better than Shapira and Chavit. Yet our architecture is much simpler. So th this is the conclusion. Um, the so advantages of the approach, I think it solves the spatial and temporal credit assignment problem. Uh, it can handle uh, very deep networks, uh, at least in theory, dense and convolutional layers. It can, uh, it can handle delays and, and trainable uh, membrane time constants. This is really cool because those parameters, you don't have them in artificial neural networks. Uh, it's agnostic about rate versus temporal coding. So this is really cool because you let Backprop decide which coding scheme is the best. In S4NN, for instance, we imposed uh, latency coding. Uh, if you convert, some people convert an INN into SNN for in France, and then, then you impose rate coding. Here, we do not impose anything. Uh, the coding scheme will be chosen. We can uh, use regularization term to encourage sparse activity fast processing, uh, and so on and so on. This is really cool. And in practice, it means uh, SNNs can be trained using classical frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow, which has which have a very large community. So this is cool. And of course, there are also <laughs> drawbacks. It's memory hungry, linear with a number of time steps. Um, we do not take advantage, at least not yet, of highly sparse tensors. Uh, it's not hardware friendly, at least not the way we are doing it, but you should see uh, MRE's work uh, for attempts to make it more hardware friendly. It's not biologically plausible, but you, you should see EPROP uh, that we heard about yesterday to for more biologically plausible versions. And that's it. I want to thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Great, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, very interesting talk and, and, and a surprising application at the end there that I yeah. hadn't considered before. I had to go quite fast for this one. But... <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got plenty of questions actually, but we're running over a little bit on time. So I'm going to I'm going to not ask anyone on screen, but rather um, combine some of the questions in, into one. Can I can I close your your shared screen or? Yes. Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so um, a number of people asked about the the latency coding. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of try and combine a few of these questions. I think a number of people wanted to sort of ask what what the bio biologically plausible interpretation of this was. Um, and the, one of the first people is asking, could you just consider it as an inverse of rate, for example? As, as an inverse of rate. An inverse uh, of rate, so it's like yeah. The yeah, I mean, rate. I mean, uh, if you, usually you know, if if you if you if you look at the neuroscience literature, uh, the latency and the rate w will be uh, highly uh, correlated, right? Because usually the neuron with highest uh, higher firing rates are also the one who which fired earlier. Um, so, so I would argue that both quantities somehow represent the for same information, but the interest of latency is you can access this, this information earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and and would you say that there was a, a sort of um, yeah? So someone asked specifically, what was the case that this is biologically plausible actually? Okay, so yeah, I did not review the the, the experimental literature, but for instance, the paper I I I, 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 
I mentioned by Coalition Meister, uh, what, what they did is um, they flashed static in, uh, images to Salamander Retina, and they show that some information were, were encoded in the relative latencies of the first uh, spike times in the retina. So this is evidence in, in the retina, but there, there is also evidence in, in V1. Um, or, or even even in IT, there's this paper by Ong and Pojo that you can do with the first spike, you can already have a lot of information. I mean, I I, I, I cannot review all the literature. Sure, here. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, all right, so let's, let's leave that one there for the moment. Um, yeah, so another question along similar lines is, so how is latency coding defined when we have a continuous stimulus in time? When there's no initial time to use it, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, this is where this is where the the limit of, of latency coding is, is, is for continuous stimuli stimuli that evolve through time. I agree that this is not the best coding scheme, and this is the second part of my talk. Right, you you need mm -hmm. more than one spike per neuron. Um, I, I I I fully agree. La la latency coding is more suitable for static stimuli. Um, cool. Um, all right, so we've got to wrap up fairly soon because we've got the next talk starting in a moment. But uh, let's just let's just have a little a little bit more. So, uh, so actually, I had a question which was, uh, and it relates to someone else's, which is, are your delays learnable or fixed? I didn't quite get that. All right, um, yeah, may, may, maybe it's they are learnable in an indirect way because 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 we have this uh, temporal kernel where. Basically, we have multiple connections between each pair of neurons, and those connections have fixed delays, and we let backprop put some weights on those connections. So, 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 mm. in many cases, backprop chooses to to discard some delays and to to focus on, on on more specific delays. But the delays, at least in this work, are fixed. Now, 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 we are working on a version where the delays would be. Completely learnable. Uh, they still have to be a number, uh, multiple number of the time steps, but uh, but this is too soon to. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. To, to describe. Um, and I think uh, I think Sander asked a similar question. Actually, so he says, "While while I like delays, I've wrecked my brain on how to do it efficiently. What's yeah. the cost of including delays at inference time?" Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, this really depends on, on on what you use to do your inference, right? Um, it, it is true. It is it is definitely true that delays have a cost at inference time, uh, especially on uh, digital hardware. Um, it, 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 it's it's always a, an, an additional difficulty to have heterogeneous delays. Um, yet. I mean, uh, it, it's always a balance between the benefit and, and the cost. No, and uh, on 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 analog hardware, you can you can have you can have delays uh, at, at no, no no additional cost of processing because the delay the delay is implemented physically. Um, okay, that's, that's that's all I can answer so far. Mm, okay, uh, I think actually we'll, there's actually a ton of questions left, but I think we're going to have to leave it there because we're we're, we're already five minutes over. Yeah, so, sorry, um, I was a bit. Uh, no, no, no worries at all. Um, would you would you like people to uh, get in touch with you to ask them their, their other questions? And if so, yes, 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 please do so. Good. Email is is the best for me. I'm not Brilliant. a okay. Twitter user yet. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, in that case, we're going to start the next session in just a moment. Um, thank you again to Tim. Great talk. Um, love all that You're stuff. Welcome. It feels like this is such an exciting area at the moment with so many like different approaches being tried. That's really cool. Okay. Bye, cool. everyone. Thanks for all your right. attention. Thanks again. Bye.